Okay, we are uh, starting our panel, and it's one of the, the last ones, or the last one. And it's, of course, after spending two, two days discussing, debating, uh, questioning, it's a time to start uh, sort of uh, doing a small wrap-up and uh, think what we have learned this, during these two days. And I think, uh, and to think about the future, not only the future of of how uh, East-West Institute is going to continue promoting ideas of importance of uh, cyber security worldwide, but also about the future of the whole sector. How do we see it tomorrow? How do we see that? Of course, this is a type of uh, industry when uh, we cannot predict very long. I think if we were in an oil industry or coal industry, or uh, gas industry in Europe, probably we would be much more easier to think about the perspective of 20, 30 years. But I think five years is the event horizon for uh, cyber security, I think. And beyond that, who knows? Maybe there will be new technology or new events, and hopefully there will be new, there will not be uh, in the cyberspace or in the virtual world big uh, catastrophes. We all hope for that. So five years is the perspective that we like to dream or to think or to analyze the future. And we have a very distinguished panel here. And before asking our, uh, and I think again uh, presenting them, it's, it's, it will be a bit waste of time because you all already know each other very well during the conference. But before coming to each of them, I would like to make some small initial comments uh, the way uh, I feel about the importance that, uh, the, about the importance of the work that East West Institute is doing. By the nature of, of what I'm doing in my life today, I, I take part in several international organizations, uh, starting from the World Economic Forum and uh, Euro-Atlantic, Russia Commission, and so on and so forth, where I'm at. Uh, involved in discussions uh, about the future of energy, food, water, and so on and so forth. Uh, virtual world, cyber world, is, is a fast-growing area of our activity. I have a, disappoint, a disappointing feeling while working with many organizations and also government that, that sometimes we get excited with the idea, sometimes we are pressed with the importance of the idea, sometimes we are forced to start making decisions and move, create organizations or make up our mind. Uh, but then something happens and we lose the pace of that. And a very sort of a bright example of that is the climate change. A couple of years ago, I think the world was basically intrigued with the, with the fact that after several years of individual lobbying, discussions, proofing scientifically the importance of climate change, the world has finally became serious on the highest level of the heads of the governments, and we got together. But then the financial crisis happened, and we don't hear much about the climate change. Now, the, of course, governments are still committed. There are several governments that are doing uh, big things and in introducing new green technologies. But there is a sort of a feeling that we are just losing pace. And I think the targets that we all are dreaming, or we're dreaming for, then in 2050, the CO2 will be reduced 50%. I think we are, there will be doubts that we'll reach there or not. So are there are the others as well, energy security, fuel, food security. So it's very important that this issue which is brought up to the general public now and an issue which is related to cyber and cyber specifically risks and security will not die and will not become one of these issues that will be just handled or dealt daily. And we just lose the focus that this is as important as the climate, as energy security, food and water, which is true. So that's... I'm taking very, very sort of a high uh, approach here, saying that it's very important that we all focus and try to give our energy and effort to make sure that this stays at the focus of government, individuals, corporates, and so on and so forth. So from that point of view, I would like to start uh, our panel, and each of our panelists, of course, will have the chance of expressing themselves, and then we'll go to the audience for your questions or remarks. And my first 
panels will be uh, will be Greg Austin. Greg, I would like to hear from you. Uh, uh, is there any way that you think that uh, my concerns will be sort of uh, brought to, to that I was wrong? What we have to do for that, and how do you see it the next five years? Well, thank you very much, Armin. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, with distinguished panelists, uh, all with unique specializations. Uh, my real interest in cybersecurity is the di diplomatic aspect and my background in international security and the military affairs of countries like the United States, the Soviet Union, Russia and China gives me a special interest in doctrine. So I'm going to talk a little bit about diplomacy and I'll address Armin's question that he um, I think has quite rightly posed. But I'll also take a lead from uh, his warning about trying to estimate too far into the future. In fact, since I'm not a technology specialist, I won't even try to predict what happens in five years' time. I think I'd rather try and answer the question in terms of what sort of future do we want to see uh, in five years' time in terms of the diplomatic arrangements for cybersecurity, for the rules of the road, for private-public partnerships, and for emergency response. I'd like to start with the observation that the cyber domain is not exclusively what happens with code, the machines, or the operators. Cyber war, sorry, cyber security is part of the fabric of our life. The cyber system is part of the fabric of our daily life. I know that's not true for everyone in the world. Uh, there are many parts of the world where uh, there's very little dependence, if any dependence, on cyber systems. But as far as the developed world is concerned, I don't see a separate domain with its own separate rules and its own separate influences uh, that are independent of the broader political, economic and social structures. That has the necessary implication that as this cyber technology advances that it's fundamentally altering the broader political, social and economic dimensions. I think there's no better illustration of that uh, than uh, Scott Charney's lunchtime presentation where he analysed uh, the intent of countries to free up global trade, which had the necessary consequence of freeing up global trade, which meant that uh, production of uh, certain technologies moved from the most advanced countries to less advanced countries, and we've seen a rapid emergence of industrial powerhouses in other parts of the world apart from uh, Europe and North America. Just one more sort of comment on the question of what is the cyber domain. I think the term cyber security, we were warned at the Dallas summit that the term cyber security can be rather dangerous. And I think that that's uh, an interesting observation. We were, in a sense, advised that we should go quickly from the term cyber security to the more uh, particular aspects of it. And I think that's a very good approach. And I'd like to illustrate that just by reference to the concept of cyber war. In my view, and I think it's shared by quite a few people, there's no such thing independently as cyber war. If there's a war between two countries, it's going to engage all of the different uh, military and political and economic assets of those two countries. That doesn't mean that you can't have a doctrine for cyber operations, just as you might have a, a doctrine for air war. So in the United States Air Force Military College, for example, Air War College, there's a concept of air war. There's been a concept of sea warfare for a couple of hundred years. So we can talk about cyber war, but it's not the totality of a war between two countries. And I think as we go forward in understanding what's possible, um, it is important to separate these things out and understand that when we talk about policy towards a cyber domain, at the higher level, uh, it's really about the texture of our daily lives. So I just want to make five quick observations which, in a sense, talk about the future we want uh, in five years' time at the level of cyber diplomacy or cyber doctrine. And my departure point would be this concept of untrustworthy country, which Scott Charney put on the table at lunchtime in what I thought was an absolutely excellent presentation. And I think Scott foreshadowed in one sense that within 18 months, it's going to be very interesting to see how this unfolds. Uh, there's going to be some coming to uh, terms in countries like the United States and Europe that the concept of untrustworthy country um, is not really a very modern concept, it's quite old fashioned. The sort of future I'd like to see in five years time in terms of untrustworthy country is that it's largely been eliminated, that uh, in one country or another, whether it's in China or in the United States or in Russia or in Western Europe, that this idea that uh, 
there are national governments out there who are interested in attacking and undermining the economic security of other major powers. I don't think that's the reality where we're at today. And I think that political strategists understand that in all sorts of other domains, apart from the cyber domain. Uh, what has happened in the last few years in respect of, say, relations between the United States and China has been a decrease in trust between those two countries because of operations that are happening in the cyber domain. So there's got to be some coming to terms with that. There's got to be some change of the habits of those two countries uh, in how they relate to each other in the cyber domain. But I think eventually that will be overcome. So I predict that within, uh, well, I don't want to predict, I would hope that in five years' time we can reach that situation where that concept that is very prominent in international affairs today of an untrustworthy country um, has changed fundamentally. What, where would I like us to be in five years' time in terms of rules of the road? I think I'd like us to have uh, understood that there are certain practices that we shouldn't be undertaking, that there are certain obligations for security uh, that exist in, in international law, and that we don't need new treaties to address those but that we can actually address them under existing international law. Uh, we had an interesting conversation this morning with some Chinese diplomats and Chinese specialists in a session on rules of the road, and they pointed back to the United Nations Charter, principles of self-defense, and so on. But they also raised a very interesting point about instead of trying to determine, to determine laws of war for cyber warfare, why don't we talk about how, what are the principles by which we can start to uh, talk about conflict prevention or, or uh, preventive diplomacy with respect to cyber operations. And I think we've seen that already in some of the statements from the United States in the last week, where by laying down markers of what the United States would find acceptable and not acceptable, by laying down markers of a positive and creative international agenda, the United States is saying, let's have a positive conversation. So I think in five years' time, this discussion about rules of the road is going to be very different. And I think we can get there. That brings us to the question of how we'll get there. Well, if you think about the current level of development of the diplomacy of leading powers, uh, the United States State Department only recently established an office of uh, cyber issues. The UK Foreign Office um, has a, a, a new bureau, uh, Office of Cyber Policy. It's so new that the sign for the office is written on card like this or on a piece of paper on the wall beside the piece of paper which says, go that way for the Libyan embassy in exile. Mm -hmm. So it's so new, really, for the... Uh, FCO in one sense. Of course, um, that's a bit flippant because the person who stepped into the role of Director of Cyber Policy is one of Britain's most experienced diplomats in the field. So it's not as if um, he's coming uh, new to the, to the um, scene. But I think we can leapfrog very quickly from this situation of foreign officers developing brand new offices dedicated exclusively to cyber diplomacy to a situation where uh, within one or two or two or three years, they've come to understand rather fully and firmly the real dimensions of the problem and how it can be addressed both through existing mechanisms and through innovative mechanisms. I'll give one small illustration of that. In a discussion I had in the Japanese Foreign Ministry, they were taking a very hard look at whether they should go down the same path as these other countries, and they were saying, well, what's going to be the benefit to Japan of investing a lot of time and money in cyber diplomacy? And they're, be they're really seriously considering the proposition that they can get to the point where they want to be in cyber diplomacy uh, without having an office of cyber diplomacy that looks and feels the same way as the uh, others. Where do we want to be in five years' time in terms of private-public partnerships? I think that uh, the unanimous view might well be that uh, we want them to be deeper, richer, and cover many more sectors, and I'm sure that will happen. But I think the most interesting evolution um, in respect of private-public partnerships will be that there is a clearer knowledge of the boundaries of responsibility and the boundaries of potential operation and the boundaries of potential action. I think that uh, all of the problems that have been put on the table in terms of what needs to be done will not be addressed. Uh, they'll never be addressed. I think it's important to build confidence in these areas, be prepared for contingencies, uh, and start to develop the international mechanisms, the levels of cooperation between the private and public sector that give confidence, that allow for flexibility, uh, and uh, most of all, provide the phone book, uh, the contact points where you can go. And one of the things I find most interesting about conversations on uh, private-public uh, partnerships in the uh, last two years with the East West Institute uh, is the understanding that they're largely American or transatlantic or European, 
the evolution which I'm hoping for in five years' time uh, is pretty much in the direction that Scott Charney foreshadowed, is that for global companies, private-public partnerships are going to be global affairs with many governments. My final point very quickly, uh, I think that in five years' time, uh, certainly I would like us to be in the situation in five years' time, where we do have a, a globally common system of emergency response, where for each country, for each major network, uh, each major system, there is not only a telephone number, but uh, an agreed set of responses to it. Now, it's unrealistic to imagine that in some poorer countries that will be the case, uh, and perhaps in many of the poorer countries that's not going to be that important. But I think I'd like us to be in five years' time in a situation where we understand uh, who to go to in countries like China, who to go to in countries like India, uh, and who to go to in countries like the United States. And I've heard it said amongst some private sector people here at this particular meeting that they know very well who to go to in the United States because they've developed those relationships very well. The systems are very well developed. Uh, uh, but uh, do they know who to call in China? Do they know who to call in India? I'm not so sure they do. So that's really where I'd like to stop. Um, I think, um, Armin, I've answered your question indirectly by suggesting that uh, if we aim for a future that we want to make, I think we can overcome many of these obstacles that have, in a sense, emerged as if they look really challenging and really difficult. But I think we can work sensibly to a set of outcomes which are widely accepted and, in a sense, put the cybersecurity issue in its rightful place. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. And uh, I think uh, what the uh, Institute is doing, and you are the uh, Vice President of this Institute, is uh, utmost of, uh, of importance here. You spoke uh, about public-private partnership, and this is something that there was a lot of discussion here at, at, uh, at the summit. But my feeling is that when I, I, I was listening to you about your vision in five years' time, I didn't see much of hope because in five years' time you, you just wanted simple basic things to happen rather than we are achieving big goals. Does that mean we are still in infancy and we don't know where we are going and there are still obstacles that we don't know how, how to address them, even how to name them? From that point of view, I would... From there, I would like to ask our next panelist, Lady Neville Jones, to, for her contribution. But before asking her to start talking, I would like to ask a simple question. Uh, this, uh, this is about, there's a lot of discussion about public-private partnership, fine. But you want to think that we need also public-public partnership, that the governments work with institutions like East-West Institute in order to learn more about the cybersecurity and also to have a channel through which they will also educate the general public. So before going into public-private partnership, maybe we need for a while when the governments use the public-public partnerships in order to get there. Please. Right. Okay. Um, I mean, my, my, my answer to your proposition is yes, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment, because I think that one of the things you learn about actually uh, government as a whole and it doesn't apply just to cyber, it applies to almost anything that, almost anything that the government tries to do these days, uh, that it needs to do it uh, in an open and pretty transparent way, and that it needs uh, not to think by itself, but to think with voluntary bodies, with uh, the, uh, the non-governmental sector, and in this instance, uh, particularly with the, the private sector. So I think, I think your, the answer to your proposition is, yes, it's a general proposition which should, should pertain in government. And it's certainly true uh, in an area and at a time when we are still at the foothills, it seems to me, of this subject. Um, I mean, I think the thing that's striking about the, about the discussion is that there, there is, a, I think, a, a, general, a general awareness, I wouldn't use the word understanding, but a general awareness of the breadth, uh, the depth, the importance uh, of cyber and the way it penetrates uh, uh, everything we do and the uh, effects that it has on, uh, on the society we live in. This is a game changer. I think any doubt about that. I mean, it is shifting power within the state. Uh, it is, to some extent at any rate, equating power between states uh, in, in the way that the economies will grow in the future. Uh, it is, uh, if not encompassing the whole of warfare, and I agree with Greg about that, I do think, however, that it is um, changing some, to some extent I its potential nature in that uh, if you can act asymmetrically against your opponent, you do not need all the weapons of conventional 
high-level warfare or indeed you know, the revolution in military affairs. Uh, and that is again a form of, of equalization between actually what it, par, uh, uh, opponents, potential opponents or opponents who have hitherto been pretty unequal. Um, and the last thing I would say, and I think in, in this area, of course, it greatly enables a new form. Uh, theft is an old, I mean, is as old as the hills and as old as man. Uh, but theft on the grand scale, grand larceny by invisible people over great distances uh, is a new phenomenon and is itself, of course, a way of transferring wealth uh, illegally. But we should not mistake, it seems to me, the potential size of the global black economy. And these are all things which, you know, taken together, seem to me to be, to constitute really potentially very big uh, changes. Um, so how does one try and respond to this? Well, they, I mean, the, I think the first thing one has to say is how aware are we of our vulnerability? And I want to just, I, I think that we are aware that there must be vulnerability and there are people at the moment who are calculating how much we're losing through money fraud. And there are others who are calculating what the likely level of espionage is. And there are yet more of us who are uh, extremely aware of um, the need to protect children or indeed online uh, pornography. Have we brought these various communities together? Uh, probably not. Uh, does government try and need to try and do that? Yes, I do think government uh, needs, uh, needs to try and take a lead. And if I can just speak for a, a moment uh, about what we're doing in, in the UK, which is obviously the context I know best, the creation of the National Crime Agency is indeed a response to the need to bring different kinds of crime together because it will cover, uh, and Janet will perhaps talk about this, but it will, it will cover uh, both the, the uh, cyber crime but also the protection of children uh, alongside what people would regard as more normal crime but integrate the police force in the pursuit of these various forms of crime so that you don't any longer have um, the, the false notion, I think, of specialization. It seems to me this needs to be mainstreamed into you know, anything that the law enforcement agencies do, the company does, or government does. And so, and we're a very long way from that. And actually, governmental organization, I don't know if it's true of corporates, I suspect it is, having lived a bit in the corporate world, uh, but it's certainly true in government. Governments find these lateral subjects very hard to deal with because we are accustomed, obviously, to the, to the vertical division of subject matter. So there is, a, there, is a, there is a challenge to governmental organization and to conceptual thinking as a result. And I think that when I look at what we've been trying to do in the British government, what we have been trying to do is to bring some of these things together. And I would say that we are still at extremely early stages. So what, do I, what would I like to see uh, in the next five years? Well, clearly, I would like to see a more synthetic approach uh, and that we have brought more of this together and that we're implementing more of these aspects alongside general principles. And those who have said we don't yet have doctrine are right. Uh, now, doctrine means you know, all sorts of different things, but uh, it seems to me it means uh, assent to formulation of and assent to certain general principles, again, to govern how you understand things and how you, uh, and how you implement uh, policy that flows from that. Um, and some of that can be general in nature and then in the different areas, obviously, there needs to be some work in detail about that, how that applies to given sectors. Because while saying we need a synthetic approach, that synthetic approach needs to be supported in depth uh, by a focusing of, on the characteristics of different sectors of the economy and indeed different acti act, uh, uh, activities in government so that each uh, has uh, a set of principles uh, which have commonalities but which in their specializations apply with particularly to these various areas. And that I think we need to develop and it's absolutely fundamental we do that because um, what is very clear is that you cannot any longer distinguish between national security and national prosperity. They're so deeply uh, woven together uh, that actually you've got to have an across the board approach. And the uh, approach that we have you know, taken in the UK, uh, as has been rightly said, is this uh, notion of putting at, at the core of our, uh, our implementation is, is public-private partnership, 
Uh, I think government needs to take a lead. Well said, but government can't do all of it. Uh, what we are seeking to do at the moment is with, you know, within the context of trusted circles to try uh, to develop the principles that will govern our approach. And we know perfectly well that that then has to be cascaded out. And cascaded out uh, means that you have to bring in you know, the, the whole of a, whole of a given sector. Uh, and one of the tasks we face, it seems to me, is how exactly we do that in a way that uh, encourages the ethic of cooperation without denying competition uh, and where people are prepared to take the reputational risk of sharing information. It is crucial to share. We are in a world now where need to know is still certainly a valid principle, but need to share is even more important. And getting the balance between those two, and they are still needed, both of them, uh, nevertheless is uh, is considerable, and there is a tendency still at the moment, I think, to allow need to know to get in the way of need to share. Uh, and that's probably particularly true in, in government, but not, not unique to government. So those seem to me to be some of the things that we, we, we need to, uh, to try and do. I do believe in an outcome approach. I think we should try and set, if we're talking about a five-year framework, where we want to be, uh, in uh, five years' time so that we have not just a sense of direction but also some measurables. You know, have we actually got there? Um, I think that's quite difficult. Um, so I don't, um, you know, I think that if we get, uh, the danger, of course, an outcome approach is you can, if, you get, if, you, if you've identified the wrong objectives, of course, you can lead, it, lead you down uh, the wrong path. But I do think that we should certainly try for that ambition rather than just setting off in a general direction we believe to be correct. Um, we certainly have to operate by the principles of risk management. I don't think there's any doubt about that, which means that we, all, we know at all times that we cannot abolish risk, uh, that we can reduce it. And one of the things we have to do by, by way of reduction, of course, is the identification of the vulnerabilities. Now, that's hard. Why is identification of vulnerability hard? Because it means what have I got wrong? Not what have you got wrong or what's coming at me. It's what have I not done or what have I not uh, done properly? Uh, and I think self-examination is one of the harder things, and, you know, <laughs> for a fairly ob obvious point. But it's, it's crucial in government, and it's very, uh, I would suggest to corporates, it's crucial. Um, Prime Minister said the other day, this is not just a matter for the cabinet, of the cabinet room, it is also for the corporate board. And I do hope that I, we are going to see uh, uh, security in this area, internet and cyber, at the board level, in the audit committee, uh, with the CSO at a senior position, uh, and there ought, to be, uh, there ought to be a responsibility at board level, in my view, uh, for cyber. Uh, and there has to be you know, an, an industry-wide approach. And I won't go over what was said uh, very well at lunchtime about uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the sectoral approach and the, and the supply chain. Very, very important. And in the end, of course, uh, a company is often only as strong as the weakest link in its own supply chain. So it has both vertical and horizontal effects. Um, finally, I just say that uh, we need, I think, to try and demystify this subject. Um, and that goes to getting uh, uh, the non-specialist and the non-professional on board for it. There is, I think, growing up at the moment, I mean, first of all, there is a great puzzle. What is this all about? But there's also, I think, developing in the public mind uh, a false distinction and, and a damaging one between uh, privacy and security. And security somehow is going to, uh, is going to we ha I have a right to communicate, uh, I have a right to expect privacy, but if you start talking to me about security, that's going to get in my way. I think it was said on this platform, and I do agree with it, that, that actually there is no real privacy without security. And so uh, getting the notion that actually security is a positive, not a minus sign, uh, is very important. Um, and it does start, I think, in the classroom. And so uh, the classroom is, an, is another very important part of this. And I, I mean, I, I get involved in things like Cyber Challenge. We need to do that at a much, much bigger scale. We are deeply underskilled at the moment in this country. Many more people needed. Uh, that's a question of raising the profile and convincing people there's a career here. There is actually something that they would want to do that they would find challenging and exciting. So there's a, there's a lot in, to be done in, by way of, of uh, taking this out of the, uh, the, the techie section of life and putting it absolutely full scale uh, in, in what people are really interested in and what 
what offers uh, opportunity. So we must turn it into something, it seems to me, which is not a burden, but which is actually uh, the way forward. And when we've done that, it seems to me we'll be on a, a much broader high road than we are at the moment. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> Before we continue, can yeah. I just come back to you again yeah. with, with a question? You have served your nation and worked uh, in British government for years, and you have seen both um, uh, uh, developments in the external relations and internal relations. I would like to ask you, we had this discussion before and starting with John I, when he was, uh, he wanted to encourage us to look at the uh, previous experiences, which in this case was the, on the international grounds, how, what, do I, what I have we learned from negotiations for the control of nuclear arms. Our experiences in, in international experiences in specific sectors, I would not say that they are very encouraging. If you look at the energy sector, for example, until today, Europe doesn't have a common energy policy. And it takes ages, years and years to negotiate that when you have infrastructure, European Union, European Parliament, but it takes ages to do that. And this is something which is not as a sort of, a, in many cases, abstract, like the, the virtual world and the cyber space. It's more, more very, very uh, foot on ground issue. The, the second experience that we had was on, related to the climate change. Uh, we all remember huge demonstrations here in London supporting uh, sort of a change in international or local uh, governance and supporting the ideas that we have to be much more green. Uh, that's a public support up to uh, His Royal Highness Prince Charles has been speaking about that internationally and showing. So it's the wide spectrum of, of, of the public uh, pushing the agenda. And it took years and years and years in order that we achieve something, and we achieved something not fully. I do remember uh, a, an interesting story. A couple of years ago, we were in Boston. There was Russia-U.S. Uh, business forum. And uh, as a guest of honor, we had their chief economist of Kremlin, Mr. Larionov, speaking on climate change. And he was representing his president, speaking about climate change. And he that that... He used to be a professor at Moscow State University and a dinner presentation became a lecture of one and a half hours where he was trying to show that all of this discussion about climate change is nonsense. Our activity, worldwide economic or industrial activity, doesn't have anything to do with the climate change. It's a natural process. And Russia will never sign the Kyoto Accord. We walk, everybody was a bit confused that this is the guy on the and um, basically said clearly that President Putin is not going to sign. The next day in the morning, morning we woke up and President Putin had signed the, the decree. So I think we had gone through a specific long process fighting for climate change, having funny stories and misunderstanding, and we are not yet there. So what we have to do now, learning from the previous experiences, to accelerate and to do it right this time. Right, well... Uh, that's a burning question, I suppose. I, I mean, I think there are, there are really two things that you need, you need to try and have when you're having a dialogue with, with public opinion. And I do think governments need to take a, take a lead in this, uh, that is, and that's quite different from saying governments then do it all. Um, you need to have evidence. Um, and that's, uh, that is, of course, where climate change is so difficult at the moment because the evidence is controverted. I think actually cyber in this area is easier than that. I don't think it's too difficult to convince people that actually there's a lot of evidence here that we're on a losing wicket if we don't do something. One. Two, you need to have a perception of self-interest. Uh, I think that's not so difficult to do, but you need to get the message out because I think the, that is not, not widely understood, that actually there's a very strong self-interest in both having some personal security and therefore uh, some privacy and therefore also um, you know, a strong foundation for your economy. So I, I don't think that's so difficult. The third thing I would say, however, is I do think trust is very important. Trust is very important. Uh, and you know, this, uh, this isn't going to work without it. But as Reagan once said, trust and verify. I actually think particularly, particularly, you know, states need actually to do verification. We need to invent, I think, some and have some measures of how we verify uh, how we're getting on. And that, that's, an, uh, that's an arena, I think, of, of real value from you know, some of the earlier negotiations uh, where we, we can, I think, 
uh, in, I hope, what will be the quest, and Greg talked about this, and I didn't cover it, therefore, uh, but where you know, we do have to develop some norms of international cooperation and behavior in this area, and I think we can also develop some, some means of common verification, and I think that would help very greatly underpin what ultimately does need to be not the system operated by trust on a daily basis. Well, thank you very much indeed. It was uh, very interesting, and I, uh, I'm very keen now to hear uh, another of uh, our panelists, because here in this audience we have uh, a big community. We have people who are here representing uh, uh, different or, um, public organizations or nonprofit organizations. There are academics here who are dealing with this issue academically. There are those who are uh, from business community that are interested to create a business case and uh, make profit or money and to serve good. But there, there are also very few of us here that actually daily have the huge pressure on their shoulders of being responsible for security in our lives. And with this thought, I would like to ask uh, Janet Williams, who is Deputy Assistant Commissioner, Metropolitan Police Service, who really is the one uh, person that is carrying the, the heavy uh, duty of providing the public with, with security because she is also currently uh, in command of security and protection for the Metropolitan Police and she is also writing the national counterterrorism security strategy for the Olympic Games. So. It's not academic, it's not about making money, it's daily work, and I, I presume it's a hard work. Janet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you wouldn't do it if you didn't love it. Um, uh, and I do, and I have fantastic people who work for me, one of whom is in this room, and I uh, certainly don't do it alone, uh, and I'm grateful for that. Thank you, Armin. Um, I, I suppose for me, uh, um, we have been engaged within the Metropolitan Police, and I cover the portfolio, um, for law enforcement uh, nationally in the UK. Um, we've been looking to try and see what we can do uh, to provide that sort of top uh, level uh, cover in law enforcement for these issues. Um, we started off in, in pr proving concept, essentially, um, and very quickly we were able to show that for every pound invested in us, uh, we were able to um, prevent 21 pounds of harm, and that happened very quickly and frankly that wasn't very difficult because there was so much harm to be prevented out there. Um, we're, we're grateful now that the government have invested in that capability and we are going to grow uh, and over the next five years as far as I'm concerned um, there are several things that we want to do. Um, first of all we've, we've got a very clear target that we want to prevent hundreds of millions of pounds worth of harm, a real tangible target. And, and I think that that's important. Policing's used to having those sort of very tangible targets and it keeps us on track. But in order to do that, um, the Metropolitan Police's national capability within Scotland Yard is not going to be sufficient for that purpose. We've got to create some regional capability across the country that's linked into us, that has a sort of symbiotic relationship with us, uh, and that we can take on uh, those threats that are national. We have, uh, over the last two years, I, I think, um, been very fortunate in creating a very different relationship with the private sector, uh, most specifically um, the financial sector where we have talked to the financial sector and, uh, uh, and with us, they are sharing information amongst themselves, not personal data. This is about threat data and trends. And also they've been sharing that very much with us, that real data on a live basis. Why do we think that's important? We think it's important because then we are able to tackle those very critical um, problems that are facing them actually now, this minute, and also that they're hitting the whole or very large sections of the financial industry. We are able to cross jurisdictions very quickly because those international organisations have a footprint across the world and they're able to bring that intelligence and information home where it's readily um, available to us. 
um, rather than me send detectives who probably love to go out all over the world, but nonetheless, that's very time consuming and expensive and too slow. So uh, we have speeded up things. So investigations which historically, in my experience, would have taken three years are taking three months because we're doing them very differently. And we couldn't do that without industry's active participation. I want to um, continue to develop that concept uh, and broaden it from uh, the financial industry through to other industries such as oil and gas and others. So where they can cooperate and coordinate activity, we can move in there as well and help to prevent and indeed chase that criminality down. And it's an important aspect for a different reason, and that is there are very few really expert network investigators. Most of you will probably realize that. There are not enough network investigators to meet the current demand that we're seeing. So the more we can work with industry and their expertise, the better. And it acts really uh, like uh, a multiplier for us. And, and that's why I think we have been so successful so quickly. I'm very interested in prevention. Um, absolutely, it's about um, uh, talking to the public uh, um, in a way that they understand with simple messages to keep them safe online. Uh, and we, have, we are working with Get Safe Online, um, that's a UK organization, government organization, to help to do that. But I, I think we can do something um, in, in addition to that, which is because we're starting to understand the tools, the capability and the capacity of the criminal online, we are equally able to um, detect um, what prevent, um, technical prevention techniques might work too. Uh, and we can share that with the broader community, and, and I'll come on to that a little bit uh, in a minute. In terms of training, um, you know, that there is a, a real need right across policing, and this, isn't, this is not just the UK, right across policing, uh, across the world, I think. Um, let's face it, most of uh, my detectives and the detectives across the world um, are not um, in the sort of uh, 16 to 25 year uh, age group. So that they will, most of them will need some help. Um, so we have to develop that training at different levels as they're going through uh, our organizations and that specialist training for specialist units that will be at the cutting edge of, of, of this uh, task. But it, it, it is improving that very basic stuff on the front line as well, really. You know, um, we, we are all in law enforcement very good at telling you how to um, put locks on your doors and locks on your windows and how to keep your car safe. And equally, uh, we should be as familiar and as confident about how to keep, t um, tell people to keep safe online and keep up with that uh, and have those sort of very um, ordinary conversations. And I think that's quite important. Um, we do absolutely uh, need the right tools for the job uh, and we are going to have to uh, invest in greater technology. But I think one of the other things that we are good at in policing is uh, cops talk to other cops. They're good at uh, talking across jurisdictions to other cops. Uh, and where other organizations might have difficulty, cops really don't it, usually. So um, we are very fortunate uh, in Scotland Yard that we have great relationships with the FBI, Secret Service, right across Europe. And we, uh, uh, we uh, hand in hand with soccer, are making really good use of those. And you need to do it if you're going to move fast enough. The legislation that we're currently working with was not designed for this sort of speed of world. Uh, and we are making um, uh, um, criminality fit the current legislation. We do need to rethink that uh, on an international dimension, but that's very slow. So perhaps we ought to also be thinking about what's already available to us that we could, um, we could adapt to use. So for example, um, we're very used to cooperating and coordinating our activity on a voluntary basis around paedophilia. 
um, equally where we are getting thousands of our citizens subject to harm online perhaps we ought to think about greater cooperation there too on a voluntary basis until such time as legislation can catch up uh, but we can't wait for it I don't think um, I uh, think one of the greatest uh, um, uh, tools that we that, that we need is to get chief executives excited about cyber generally uh, and cyber security chief executives will make the rest of their organization sit up and um, uh, and take uh, responsibility for this um, and and um, that's one of the things that I'm really going to be pressing over in the next uh, five years and I think uh, the virtual task force format is perfect to introduce that because it does bring us into contact with those chief executives who are taking an active uh, engagement uh, in it Finally, the police service in any, in any, organiser, in any country, and, and uh, the UK is not unique in this, um, is only one part of this jigsaw. Um, you know, it is about um, the security services, it is about the MOD, it is about, in our terms, the Foreign Office, Cabinet Office, all being a part of our crisis response to a cyber attack. Uh, understanding what part of the jigsaw we are, what the entire picture on the box looks like and how it all fits together and making sure that it can fit together in speed is a real critical aspect for the next uh, um, couple of years and one that the UK is actively working on and, and we are most engaged with. Uh, and finally to Rebecca I think, you know, when, when she was uh, talking uh, about um, making sure that uh, this isn't all bad news. Um, you know, I think that the internet is one of the most wonderful tools um, and one, one of the most wonderful inventions um, that we probably could have never imagined uh, in our, uh, when, when we were kids. So um, it is really important that, yes, we put some real cybersecurity around it to make sure that we feel safe. Um, but it is also really important to understand why we're doing that. And we're doing that because this is a fabulous tool for industry, a, tab a fabulous tool bit for um, commerce, a, fa a fabulous tool for communication, and a fabulous opportunity for the next generation. And, and I think we all um, really ought to be bearing that in mind when, in whatever we do. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jan. May I just... You spoke about uh, speaking to public. Yeah, it's, I think it's, uh, in our understanding, it's one of the very important parts of, of the, your activity as a police general is speaking yeah. to the public, explaining. Yeah. Uh, speaking to the public in the virtual world or virtual space, and where you were referring yourself that this is a public of 16, 25 years old. Yeah. So I think, first of all, you have to speak to the, in the, the same language which in this case is virtual English. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so secondly, you have to, to speak a language that they will understand. That means you have to have uh, uh, the policemen or the police ladies who are basically from the same age because they do understand what this age of group age of people. So are you looking of recruiting people or how you are going to approach and to have a, a proper dialogue with the public which has very specific attitudes and, and qualifications? I, I think it's a mixed economy. Um, I, I, I think that we are bringing in people who, who really do understand um, the cyber uh, community and uh, who can talk that language. But equally, you know, um, I'd like to say that my mother is 83 years old um, and uh, she uh, is online virtually every day and when people talk about the wi wisdom being given to young people, um, my children taught her how to, how to use the internet. She taught them how to be safe online. Because, not because she knew about the internet, but because she had the wisdom to understand that some of the risks, there's some of the risks. So I don't think it, all this is, you know, having to talk the right language. Um, I don't think we should get bogged down in that. And also, I don't think it's all a police job to do this. I think it's every single parent's job. I think it's school's job. I think it's industry's job. I think, you know, all of us have a responsibility here. Policing will play its part, but it's not its entire responsibility. Well, thank you very much. It's very interesting, your response. 
May I just ask another question related to, to your work? Uh, and I think this is on record, but maybe we can ask for off the record for this specific question. Which is the worst scenario for you that can happen in cyberspace during the Olympics? What sort of attack you would be expecting, or what is that you would have to be ready for that? <laughs> um. Well, I, you know, I, maybe I, we can help. <laughs> um, maybe we can help. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I mean, I I think that we are um, being very sensible in our preparation for the Olympic Games, and um, in terms of our analysis of the threats, um, we're looking at uh, right agency, um, the agencies all coming together and sharing information and intelligence. We're also doing a great deal of work internationally to understand that the threats, the threats that might be coming from that direction. Um, and we're doing lots of what ifs, um, and we are exercising that, uh, and we will continue to exercise that. Um, and you know, the government um, is very, uh, very engaged in that and is having a series of uh, COBRA exercises to ensure that we are ready and piecing are playing the part in that. Do you think that uh, organizations like East West Institute could be a sort of virtual partner of the Olympic Games and partner to you to help you to prevent and to help to, to make it? Um, I, I think that we are very interested in um, those people who can add value, and I'm sure your organization can, um, to, tr to help us to, to um, ensure that we're um, uh, pulling in the right direction, that we have really got a true understanding of the threats and that we, our level of preparedness meets those threats. Um, I think we'd be foolish to say no to that and I'm sure, um, uh, I'm sure that would be welcomed. Well, thank you very much indeed. We, we started with, uh, with some sort of a large view over the issue, then we went to the uh, issues related to the government policies and how that policies could be applied to specific cases and very, very specific case of Olympics. But at the end of the day, it comes also to, to simple issues about technology. Does it work and how does it work? What are we facing today? What are the solutions to that? And uh, we are privileged to have here Jason Pontin, who comes from, who is the editor of the MIT Technology Review and in his capacity as the editor, I'm sure that he's daily looking and analyzing and thinking about new technologies and what is going to come in the next five years. Thank you, Armin. I'll, I'll be brief. I am the editor of Technology Review, which is the world's oldest technology publication, and I come at this with a technologist's perspective. And the first thing, of course, to say is that the subject matter which we've been discussing for the last two days could not be more important. Our entire technological civilization is dependent upon this shared common public network. Um, and the pleasing thing as an observer from the last two days is that there is broad consensus amongst the delegates to this summit about what an, appro an appropriate doctrinal um, uh, approach would be. Uh, Lady Neville Jones called it a synthetic approach. Um, it would involve cooperation, it would involve sharing. Um, and that was fulfilling for me to hear. But at the same time, it seemed to me as a technologist that almost all the details which I care about are, are largely lacking. And the first thing to say, and Raoul can talk about this in more detail than I, is that technologically we are, we are losing the battle. Um, just over the last four or five days, I have been inundated with stories, as have you been, with defeats in the war against hacking and spam. Um, from the extraordinary and mounting cost to Sony, from the breach of its PlayStation network, I believe $171 million to heal the breach and tens of millions more lost in lost sales, to Google's hack, which was announced yesterday, the hack upon Lockheed Martin the week before, we're losing. And the truth is that we do not have, at the moment, any commonly accepted solutions to what technologies could, could cure these breaches. We do not have 
good forensic technologies to trace back an attack to its attributive source. Um, but there isn't even really a mechanism at the moment to manipulate data securely in the cloud. The most promising technology was, in fact, suggested first at MIT. It's called homomorphic encryption. Um, it's a fancy way of saying that data which is encrypted in the cloud can remain in the cloud and still be manipulated in its encrypted form by indirection. A gentleman called Craig Gentry is the leading researcher. But at the moment, it too is a kind of hack. It is, it's years away from completion. And the most informed people I know on the subject will often remind you that the public internet was never designed to do what we're expecting it to do. And it was designed to allow university and uh, government communications uh, in packet form in the event of a nuclear war. And we're requesting it to be the basic network for all our commercial, social, and communications. So if we do have to develop a, a second private secure internet, separate from the, the public shared internet, that's a big job. And we, we need to get work on, to work on it now. The other remark I'll make is that even in the issue of doctrine, though we've all agreed on the broad standards for what uh, a synthetic approach might be, um, even there, all the details remain to be decided and discussed. In fact, we, we do not have any international accords. There are no commonly accepted incentives to, to industry. There are no mandates. There are no fines. And at the level of the legislative process, what it would take to begin to go and create a, a common infrastructure where public and private organizations could work together isn't clear. There is a gentleman at MIT called Eric Brynholfsson, who is the uh, professor of digital business at the Sloan Management School. And he takes a darker view than, than I do, but he believes that so large are the difficulties about securing the, the public internet, so little do we know about the technology, uh, so far away are we from any international acceptance of what common treaties would be, that he thinks that we'll never make much progress until there is some kind of a, a digital catastrophe, um, what in the business they call the, the digital Pearl Harbor. Um, it's been a pleasing two days for me to hear such consensus about what we need to do. But I, I also leave these two days with um, much skepticism and a little pessimism, pessimism about how much work needs to be done. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I think uh, I was wondering to ask you what will happen in five years. <laughs> but the, the way you started that we're losing the battle, uh, I, I'm now afraid of asking that question because maybe you'll answer that we will be already <laughs> lost. Well, so, well, something bad will happen in the next five years. Something worse will happen than the, the breach of, of Gmail. Um, something worse will happen than the than the loss of Lockheed Martin intellectual property. Something worse will happen than a breach on, an, on a toy platform. Um, and I think the best that we can hope for is that it should be sufficiently bad that the, the marketplace of ideas and the real marketplace of capital markets will begin to price the value of digital security in a realistic fashion. And this will become part of both the way we organize government, the research funding that goes to public institutions to develop these more secure technologies, and perhaps most of all that the that large companies should begin to take this as a serious part of the cost of their operations. The most striking part about Sony's breach is they've had this before. This happened to them less than seven years ago when they had a massive breach of their security on a different platform. And yet, when the, when the Sony PlayStation was finally breached, Sony did not have a chief information security officer. In fact, uh, digital security at Sony is distributed throughout the company through a whole variety of uh, management structures. So, the best I can hope to offer the delegates in the room is a technologist, is the hope of a, of a small-scale catastrophe um, that um, we can, that, that will cause people to take this as seriously as all of you do. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jason. I think I, I have to go now immediately to Raul Schoenberg. <laughs>
because I hope that he's more uh, optimistic than you. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll end up <laughs> in a gloomy mood. Please. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, let me start by saying we are definitely not on the winning side. Is that better? Uh, well, I think uh, in my job, uh, I have about 10 years of experience doing threat research for uh, Kaspersky Lab, which is an antivirus company. And in my daily job, collaboration is absolutely the key. Um, our sales and marketing uh, divisions between the different anti-malware companies, they are competitors, but the researchers, they are friends, and we work together. We are allies, because we all realize that if we try to do this by ourselves, we will fail. So we work together. And uh, over the last couple of years, we've also definitely been working more and more together with law enforcement, and uh, we have had some uh, successes in, in, in taking down botnets and all that. But uh, aside from that, looking forward into the future, five years from now, well, what are we trying to solve? I think that when we look at the cybercrime, we have three major issues. What, the first one is, let's say, the, the mass attack, which is just targeting individuals, mostly consumers. So this is the, your, your run-of-the-mill stuff that just ends up in, on a, in a random website. Second, we have uh, targeted attacks against companies. This is either for, um, let's say, cyber espionage or for, uh, as I like to call them, private uh, identifiable information jackpots. Uh, so the big uh, data breaches we have been seeing right now at Sony, Epsilon, and so on, which could actually be a targeted attacker's uh, dream. Uh, as you are able to devise very clever uh, targeted attacks against uh, people. And the third one is not cyber war warfare, it's cyber sabotage, because we need to keep in mind that critical infrastructure does not have to be attacked necessarily by a nation. It can very well be at attacked by s some, some person, some individual with, with certain motives. So let, let's look, try to look at some solutions. For the first one, targeting uh, threats targeting consumers. To rely on the consumer to protect themselves, I'm afraid that is not, not a realistic option. Uh, while education is definitely very important, that will simply mean that the average level of the attacks, the sophistication will go up, as we have seen you know, over the last couple of years. So that's already pro uh, proven to be the case. So it's getting harder and harder to educate. But uh, secondly, we also have the fact that attribution is very, very tough. The amount of arrests that we've had, um, though uh, definitely increasing, we are uh, arresting more cyber criminals, and that's a good thing. But the bad thing is that there is absolutely no dent in the amount of uh, malware and cyber attacks in the world. In fact, it's still growing. That means that the number of arrests is, well, not, not enough. So rather than trying to follow the cyber criminals, we need to consider following the money. Uh, the, the most visible problem on the internet today for consumers uh, is uh, the so-called scareware, which was addressed uh, yesterday during lunch. The, the, these are the programs which pre pretend to be antivirus scanners, and they say, hey, you have a couple dozens of infections, you need to remove them, but please give me $50. And in reality, there are no different viruses, and the, the program is the virus. And the, the, the estimated revenue last year, it's easily in the hundreds of millions of dollars. And by that, it would be the fifth or so largest anti malware company in the world. Uh, so what can we do about that? We need to talk to the credit card companies. Because in reality, it is a very big visible problem. There are only a few credit card processors, payment processors, actually processing all these payments. Yet when I try to talk to Visa, MasterCard, Amex, whomever, uh, th there is silence at the other end. So uh, wh what I hope to achieve here is hopefully uh, to get your interest in this area. And, um, through, through policies or mandates or, or, or whatever, we need to um, start talking to these companies and uh, incentivize them and actually to stop these payment processors, cut them off. If we, are ha we are obviously having this huge problem actually getting uh, cyber criminals arrested because maybe they are in a different country, they manage to hide themselves well. Well, the, the, the only tangible solution in that case is simply to make it very hard to make money. And uh, 
I guess one of the problems w with these payment processors is that uh, the credit card companies, um, well, they don't necessarily have to cooperate. It's, uh, may maybe these payment processors also uh, uh, take care of some legal, uh, so some, some legitimate uh, payments and so on. And at, at the same time, it's these credit card companies who are making money off of these transactions. So currently, there is very little incentive for through these credit card companies to actually uh, be more aggressive with these payment processors, which I think is a big problem. And moving on to the second problem with the targeted attacks against uh, businesses, I think that, as Jason was also pointing out, is that we, we need to incentivize a company somehow uh, to be more secure. Um, and, and I think that that's very tough because when, when you look at, for instance, uh, mobile devices, if you look at the iPhone, the iPad, you have the, the free app, with the free application which shows you ads and transmits your personal data and you have the one dollar app which doesn't do any of that nasty stuff and the vast majority of people uh, will select the free app. So, so consumers again are not willing to pay for that. Uh, which I, I think from my point of view means that uh, we need to incentivize, bi uh, push businesses into being more secure. And uh, I'd really hope that the market would somehow try to uh, establish this, but, but up until now, this do doesn't seem to be the case. Um, and, and, and in a slightly different angle, if we uh, do look at the, the RSA breach and, the, uh, and some other uh, very high-profile breaches, if these companies had been running the latest version of, their so of the specific software that was being targeted, then at least that particular attack wouldn't have worked. But uh, uh, actually uh, acquiring those latest versions, that costs money. So, so somehow uh, we, we need to convince uh, businesses to, to increase the IT, uh, IT budget, if that's uh, by somehow fining them if they get compromised or by subsidizing something. I don't know, maybe you guys have uh, better solutions for that. Uh, anyway, uh, going to the third problem of cyber sabotage, well, I think uh, a lot of people thought that Stuxnet was the big disaster that everybody was waiting for that would wake up governments around the world and realize, well, our critical infrastructure is in danger and something very serious could happen. Well, the reality of the matter is that that really hasn't happened. I've spoken to a lot of these companies, which are obviously right on the, on the edge, right on the border of the public-private uh, intersection. And all, all these uh, companies, they are telling me that their top management is still not allocating any additional resources to improve uh, the security of these companies. Nothing is changing uh, right now. And, and that's obviously very worrisome because uh, if Stuxnet isn't that game changer that, that we all needed, then what, what's it going to be? Does it ha have to be an attack on the West instead of the Middle East? Uh, that somehow seems very foolish. Uh, so I, I, I think we uh, re really need to improve, and especially speaking for the U.S. organizations, uh, they, they have pretty much unanim unanimously told me that unless uh, certain security measures are mandated uh, by D.C., they are not happening. There is only budget for that which is mandated by D.C. Uh, and well, we, we know that governments move slowly. Uh, so so that's, that's all very uh, uh, worrisome. And I think that, that five years from now, we really need to have changed uh, our attitude. Uh, collaboration is very important and can definitely help us do certain things, but it's not the, the, the final solution. We, we need to incentivize businesses to, to change their approach and maybe make consumers realize that uh, additional security costs money. Um, but if, if we don't change, then... Uh, then it's not going to look pretty in five years. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Well, I think <coughs> you added, of course, as, as predicted, more questions rather than <laughs> answers. But, uh, Nekes, I want to ask you another uh, a question. I think you are addressing to CEOs of companies that they are basically not uh, – are, are, are not planning properly, are not spending money, are, are not uh, allocating funds and personnel. They don't have security officers. 
And we're speaking about uh, energy companies, infrastructure companies, or uh, construction companies. But in the meantime, you both described a situation when one of the leading electronic companies in the world that is producing uh, wonderful computer games that are on web, they don't have the understanding of a necessity of having chief cybersecurity officer and allocating money. So do we have to prove to Sony that they need that? It, it could be an option. I know the, the state of Massachusetts uh, quite recently implemented a law saying that uh, if you, you have a data breach and we, we will basically audit your systems and if we see that you, you are not complying to, to our laws saying you, you need to take certain measures in terms of protecting personal identifiable information and so on, we will fine you. And I think it was one or two months ago that the, the first uh, uh, Boston-based business was actually fined about $250,000 for their breach. And I guess the question uh, at that point uh, is, is, is $250,000 more or less than the amount of money it would have cost them to implement uh, these security features? I, I think it is going to require a, a regulatory approach of, of some sort. If if a loss of $171 million in a very short period of time to Sony wasn't sufficient, um, it's certainly not going to be sufficient to other companies. It's telling, I think, that um, it's a data point that many of you perhaps have heard, that the Fortune 500 spends more by a factor on physical security than they do on digital security. Um, the one company in Silicon Valley that takes this seriously is a company that is to some degree relieved of ordinary market pressures because of the, the fire hose of cash it gets from advertising, which is Google. So Google takes this very seriously. But companies you would expect to be much more sophisticated, um, like Sony, haven't. So the best approach would perhaps be to place a regulatory mandate upon the entire industry. But I think for that to really work, because as we've been saying the last two days, um, we exist in an international innovation economy that will have to be not just a, an American and British and European approach. It will have to be something we do, we do as a world community. Would you like to ask? Uh, well, I, 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 do, I do actually agree with that. I mean, I think that, that we one of the principles of the security world is, is layered security. Not everything or everybody needs to be equally secure. Mm -hmm. What you do need to decide is what the minimal level of security in any given area is. And so I think that that is, and that, that itself is not particularly simple, but is certainly an identifiable thing. And I think we, we are going to have, in the end, I think, to mandate certain minimal standards uh, with penalties attached. And I think that will be, in the end, helpful to general security. Uh, you're quite right to say that this should not be done on a national basis, even an economy as large as the U.S., because the corporates that are actually going to sell and implement I mean, are multinational organizations themselves. And so uh, getting commonality across, across jurisdictions uh, is going to be very important. Uh, but I do think in the end it, it's for some area in some parts of the world to lead and hope that they can then set the standards for others. And I would like to see us doing that. And I think that is important. Uh, and it's certainly going to help the whole problem of the limitations of law enforcement. Because as Janet was pointing out, you know, uh, these guys are very often outside your jurisdiction. And so you've got alternatives. You can make yourself less vulnerable against them or you can disrupt them. Very often, however, you're not actually able in the end to go after them th uh, through the law. Um, that's probably, you know, of all the three things you can do, uh, it's important, and it's important for the reason of, of actually just, you know, for example, uh, and encouraging them and, um, and making it clear that this isn't a paying proposition. The truth of the matter is that making yourself less vulnerable and disrupting them are going to be more important as tools. Thank you. I, I just wonder if um, an, um, an additional approach may be that... Um, sort of talking in, in business terms to businesses, which is about if, if it's financially in their interest to um, adhere to standards, then they would do so. So if we aligned our procurement, large organizations, governments or, um, looked at our procurement rules, and we were only prepared to do business with people who had standards that we could that, that, that we accepted, then actually it would become in people's interest to start to adhere to those standards. And we do that 
in other ways. We, we use procurement rules for a whole variety of things. And we, I don't think we've used them in that way, but, but it's an idea that may work. I think we should and we will. Well, it's, uh, if we look at the issue, at the end of the day, it's, it's the public, specific part of the society or the general public that is suffering. And I do understand it's very difficult in, the, in many cases to, to find who did it. Because it's a different country, different legislation, you don't have the right tools yet and all of that stuff. But at the end of the day, who allowed this to happen, it's absolutely clear. It's the re leadership of, of, let's say, Sony in this case. And at the end of the day, uh, there must be pressure on the leadership saying that, first of all, you are a public company. You are representing interests of a big group of people worldwide that are buy buying your shares. Secondly, at the end of the day, who is paying is also the public because their identities or information about them is stolen. So there must be pressure on those who are leading these companies that they have to understand that they have responsibility basically in front of the general public and specific public in their countries to protect. And if they don't do that job, then they have to answer for that. You say it's at the end of the day you brought an example of a credit card company. Well, I've seen many cases from my friends and relatives who have been traveling using credit card because they change the country and they go to somewhere else. The credit card company is calling them from India, someone, and if though they don't get the, the person, that because there's an instruction of a credit card company, they call once, twice, and if the person is tra traveling from one Italian city to another one and he cannot pick up the phone, they are just closing, stopping the, the credit card. That's it. So who is suffering? The, the member of the, of the public who is traveling, they cannot use their credit card because it's much more safer for a credit con uh, card company rather than talk to you and to others to find ways of protecting your credit card from theft. So I think... We come back uh, after a round that I think the general public and institutions mm -hmm. that are representing also interests of the public have to have higher and stronger voice and asking, first of all, not only the government but also corporate leaders that they have responsibility. And uh, I think we don't have much time but I would love to give the floor to the, to, to the public <laughs> and, and hear from them. Please identify yourself microphone and other question or remark please three three quick points uh, number one if you want to get involved in policy the policy makers congressional leaders have no background in science and technology so my first uh, suggestion for EWI would be to invite policy makers uh, the second one is if you look at the crowd here you have people from AT&T Cisco um, Microsoft, how many policemen, firemen, bankers, physicians are here? So you have no idea, uh, you, you might know about networks, but you do not know necessarily how all these individuals use the cyberspace. So my second uh, suggestion for EWI would be to invite in the next meeting the sectors to be present so you have a very different perspective of how cyberspace is being used by the users. And the third one is once we know how they use it, with the help of the Microsoft, AT&T's, Cisco's, we can suggest some policy and help write that policy for the policymakers. Thank you very much. Gentlemen there. Uh, Pavan Dugal, President, Cyber Law, Asia, and Advocate, Supreme Court of India. A quick question to the panelists. Uh, I believe, and this is my perception, that in the next five years, the rogue internet is going to emerge as a major force. Now, what do the panelists feel? What will be the impact of this rogue, this evil internet, on electronic governance projects and electronic governance initiatives that have been initiated by governments across the world? Do you think, is that a reality, or is it just a matter of conjecture? Anybody in the panelists? Thanks. Well, thank you very much. Any further questions? I'll collect questions because we don't have much time and then ask the panel to answer. Hi, Alvin from the Bank of New York Mellon. I just wanted to first and foremost and say that there are several representatives across the financial services sector who are here and can talk with you and happy to do so about how we 
use information technology. I'm sorry, we don't hear well. Can you just Sorry, that? my name is Valerie Aben. I'm from Bank of New York Mellon. And I was just pointing out to the other gentleman's remark that there are several of us here and actually attended a breakout session um, uh, on financial services who come from the financial services sector who can happily attest to our uh, involvement in this EWI and, and how we are working together with all of you to talk about how we use and leverage information technology and what we're doing in the world of cybersecurity. Uh, a number of you talked about the issue of regulation. Um, obviously, our sector is highly regulated, um, and, uh, and that regulation um, actually has to come with extensive oversight, which means you have to have a team of qualified examiners mm -hmm. who actually are holding you accountable for that regulation and the standards um, that they are, are requiring that you implement within your financial services firms, which means you have to pull on a, on a pool of talent in order to have that team of examiners to actually ask those questions and actually implement that examination and oversight to hold you accountable to that regulation. And so my question to the panelists would be, where do you expect us to pull this talent from to be able to implement this regulation and who will pay for the cost of developing this talent and the regulation and actually executing on that oversight across all of the critical infrastructures? Well, thank you. Talkman, I'm a privacy and internet lawyer. Um, I was wondering if we really had lost the battle with the, beast, beast, with the big company losing data. Uh, maybe you were talking about incentivization of the companies. Do you think these companies had really participated to the battle? And did they have deployed really uh, what they should have done to avoid uh, the, 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 the breach? And from a, a consumer uh, point of view, uh, what do you think about breach notification and what do you think about the power of consumer that the data has been leaked and what they could do against the companies? And in general, what do you think about the audit of the company in terms of security and risk management and the well, power of the information commissioner? Well, thank you very much indeed, please. My name is Ricardo Sibilla from the Swiss Ministry of Defense. Um, uh, as you mentioned, uh, as the but technology uh, Technologists on the panel mentioned, we are losing the battle pr uh, on, on that on that on that one. And uh, one one thought that comes through my mind is that if the means we are using to fight uh, the, uh, the the threat isn't standing in our way uh, f uh, of winning that battle, in particular uh, protection measures which are highly reactive, mm -hmm. like virus uh, scanner that are based on, on uh, old knowledge and, uh, and uh, uh, in fact, fighting just a part of the threat, uh, the one which is known and not the one that is specifically written for a particular target. Uh, and the business model that is behind this uh, virus scanner, which is based on selling us this knowledge uh, and uh, through updates, uh, instead of a, a way of protecting which is more preventive and more uh, perhaps less comfortable in terms of usage for, for the user, but uh, more effective in terms of preventing the system being compromised. Uh, isn't that uh, approach blocking us from winning? Well, thank you very much. I think I'll, I'll ask our uh, panelists to quickly answer the questions and give us also their final, uh, final thoughts out of our discussion. All right. my, 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 my. The first big final thought, actually, is, I mean, against the background of being told, you know, we're losing the battle, is never give up. Yes, that's true. That's <laughs> we true. may be in a bad place, but we're in a much worse place, so we've got to you know, start now. Uh, and I don't actually think this whole thing is hopeless. Um, on the various questions that we were asked, um, and the whole question of governance, I do think that uh, there's a, a role for uh, governance, which I think has to emerge out of some of the international conferences that are going to be held, I think, in the foreseeable future, and some principles by which we, we all operate and try to cooperate uh, over the use of the internet. Um, I don't know how much, whether it can get more formal than that, uh, but, uh, you know, we do have a, a crime convention. There may be other conventions which will be useful to have. You can see from what I say that I, I have a limited reliance, I think, on, on law. I think law, law is quite important. I'll come to the business of regulation in a moment. Uh, I do, in fact, think in the end, uh, self-interest is going to be a better guide to getting good behavior. 
On regulation, however, which I, I, I mean, I do think there are some minimal standards that we probably do have to put in place, I do not envisage, I really do not envisage that they should then be implemented through an elaborate compliance system. Uh, this is not the game, and banks shouldn't think of it in those terms. I mean, compliance is there very heavy-handed inside banks, partly because of all sorts of internal conflicts of interest otherwise, uh, and it's a special regime. Uh, uh, when it comes to this kind of thing, it's the normal enforcement of the law. You know, you're expected to obey the law, and if you fail to obey the law and you get caught out, you're penalised. Uh, but I don't think we're going to go rush around inspecting. Uh, and it's going to be for the board, in the interest of the shareholders, actually to get this right, and the shareholders to penalise the board if they fail to. It should be just normal corporate governance. Um, and I hope, therefore, you know, that those, those uh, factors will apply. And the same applies, I think, when it comes to the whole question of do we put more powers into the hands of the information commissioner or the, or the surveillance commissioners. There are certain roles and there are some particularly sensitive areas when it comes to people's rights and to, and to the question of privacy, where it may well be right to extend the role of some of the commissioners. But on the whole, I think I would say that the power of uh, these commissioners is much more to ensure uh, that the framework of law is right. Uh, and that the, pub, the framework within which public policy, which also should guide to some extent what happens in the private sector, is in with the right framework, but not actually to go round down the road, which is what people are scared of, is the heavy hand of government telling them what they may or may not do on a daily basis. You know, this, this is where the responsibility of individuals in democracy really does have to, I think, come into play. Might I say one last thing? It's very instructive, I think, that we have not word, mentioned the word terrorism. Um, I think we do, it is part of the scene, uh, but then actually this is very much bigger. And we haven't, of course, mentioned the military, partly because this isn't that sort of conference. And there's only one thing I would say, which is we do need to link the military capabilities with the civilian. They aren't a separate compartment, and partly they aren't a separate compartment because up there are a whole lot of satellites that we need, uh, and we need a space policy too that protects those. And so there is a linkage between the different components of policy uh, that we shouldn't forget, and it does cross uh, the civilian military divide. So, very briefly, um, to the question from the representative from the Swiss Ministry of Defense, of course we can never keep up as long as our technological approach um, is responsive, as long as it's responding to existing viral threats. But the good news is there are real technologies that are being developed right now, whether they're homomorphic encryption or more radically Internet 2, that could provide a secure public network. But they're going to require years of research and civilizational scale investment. And to the question from the representative from the Bank of New York Mellon, whenever anyone begins to frighten the general public about regulation, they paint a picture of a vast and burdensome regulatory framework. But it's important to remember that the Internet is today almost entirely unregulated. It came out of the wild west of Silicon Valley's cyber libertarian ethos. And a small general foundation of minimal regulation is in fact probably salutary. And if we'd had it, we perhaps we wouldn't be in the situation we are now. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yes, well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I think EWA will take note of the questions. They're all very well uh, directed, and uh, we've written them down, and uh, I think we'll answer, um, take them on notice. Thank you. So. Um, I'd just like to um, respond to just one of the questions. Forgive me for, for not doing all of them, but on the prevention one, um, you know, I do think antiviral um, uh, uh, good uh, protection is important, but I do also agree that it's not all of the answer. Um, Policing generally, um, you know, has had a very traditional view of prevention, which is um, you look at what works, you analyse it slowly, and then you give out those lessons uh, in order that people can protect themselves. I think what we have learned um, over the last two years is that you need to be so much faster than that. And in order to really protect uh, our large global economies, we ought to be uh, looking at what is happening now online and work with proactive academia to understand how it's likely to morph, how it's likely to uh, attack next, and what we can be doing to patch in the short term but really mitigate that risk in the medium term. So it is much more dynamic and we need much more dynamic tools and people with the training and capacity 
to uh, effect, effectively use those tools. So that's what I'd say about prevention, a completely new way of thinking, I think, um, for law enforcement uh, in this arena. It, it, the, and, and the final thing I'd just like to say was, when I was in the anti-terrorism branch, we used to have the saying which was, um, we should be short on sleep and long on memory. Uh, and it worked well for us. And, and I think in a cyber world, it's something about short on sleep and long of arm. Uh, because we need to reach right across jurisdictions. Uh, and that's my big takeaway, I think. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll very quickly address the, the, the antivirus question because uh, though I don't get asked anymore these days, so do you write the viruses? Not these days that, that's over uh, as, as the threat landscape has changed. But these days I get asked, so why is the antivirus uh, software so stupid? And uh, uh, th there seems to be this misconception that the, the antivirus software that existed 15 years ago is, well, the same s stuff that exists today, and that, that's certainly untrue. Uh, in our software, for instance, you can say, I only want to run whitelisted applications, but that's not, uh, that, that's not gonna work for consumers. Consumers will be very annoyed because they will not be able to play their, their game or something like that. So what we really need to keep in mind is uh, th different systems or different targeted audiences require uh, different levels of security. Uh, for instance, ATMs are generally not running this kind of whitelisted only software, which is really exposing ATMs where there is really no need to. Uh, on the other hand, I do know that uh, the US DOE is looking into uh, potentially uh, building completely new hardware and a completely new operating system just to protect the critical infrastructure from attack. Yeah. Well, thank you, Raoul. And not to, to finish on the pessimistic note that came from James uh, sorry, Jason, sorry. I would like uh, to, to maybe finish this saying that probably the infancy or the honeymoon of 20 years with Internet is coming to the end. That's the pessimistic part. And we hope to prove that we are grown up and we can take responsibility in the next five years. Thank you very much.